Welcome uh, everybody to our I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer June Kim as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from the San Francisco Bay Area, June is currently based in Brooklyn. She recently graduated with an MFA in photography from the Parsons School of Design. June spent a few years working marketing and advertising before making a transition into photography and began freelancing in 2016. Her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally at Photoville, Incheon International Festival of Photography and Video, Opium Gallery in France, and Milk Studios in New York. Flowing between fine art, fashion, and editorial photography, her work stands on the threshold between dream and reality. Her images are driven by a passion for poetry, geometric shapes, minimalist architecture, landscapes, and the uniqueness of each location. For the past three years, June has been working on projects centered around her own cultural identity as a Korean American and everybody here gets a bit of a sneak preview tonight um, on this body of work, which she will be sharing. Please help me welcome June Kim to our lecture series. Yay. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend I can hear. <laughs> um, I will share my screen now. Um, go. Great, um, thank you. SBA and Jaime and everyone for having me. Um, it's kind of an interesting time to talk about this work that I'm gonna show um, just because it's a lot of work that's been quite personal that I haven't quite um, shown yet. And also uh, I think we're in a very interesting time where we're having a lot of hard conversations about race. And um, a lot of what I was doing in grad school uh, from 2017 to 19 was thinking about my own cultural identity and how to portray that through photography or find um, the people in contemporary photography that I could reference. So a lot of um, what I'll show you today is my work, but also um, a lot of my inspiration. So um, be prepared to see not only my work, but some others um, that might hopefully inspire you as well. Um, and also some readings. Um, so hopefully, uh, it'll be a good mix of everything. So I'm gonna play this. Great, so I will start here. Um, photography for me really started off as an escape. Um, as Jaime mentioned, I worked in business and advertising um, and studied business in undergrad. Um, so didn't have like an art school background, but I started off working in the ad world. And while that was exciting, I spent a lot of my time um, on the weekends to explore other places, other cities. Um, hold on one sec. Ah, there you go. Um, and a lot of this work, uh, it's funny, I went back and kind of dug it all up and a lot of this work was the early stuff, um, you know, checking out uh, locations, kind of bringing people into them, um, also just creating images wherever I could. Um, and at the same time, I was also checking out um, exhibitions at MoMA, um, especially on the third floor, uh, photography exhibitions um, at SF MoMA and if I happen to be in New York, uh, MoMA here. So um, for me, photos at that time were a direct reflection of that desire for escape. I found myself really drawn to locations, um, hunting down places that inspired me and imagining people in them. And this particular image, as well as many others, um, I began taking trips further out and collaborating with my friend, Michelle Cho. Um, and she and I would just like, couldn't get enough of it. I think we were just um, traveling and dreaming up kind of worlds and images together. Um, so we would find these locations using ourselves or people around there um, as our subjects and just making images. Um, and perhaps that's how many people have been introduced to my work, um, this image in particular. Um, we found these locations and as friends 
um, or people we met in those cities to be in them and often drawing from our own imaginations or and storyboarding ahead of time. Um, so yeah, that was a lot of that early work. And a lot of this was around 2016. And throughout this time, I was constantly looking at the work of other photographers as well. Um, this image in particular is by Todd Heido um, and actually Spike Jones, the director of the movie Her, um, references this image as one that inspired the movie um, or in part inspired it and inspired the character of Samantha, um, who's the AI in the film. And um, this particular image just struck me as well because of its quality of this infinite gaze that we can have on this um, woman. We don't see her face, but it feels close and familiar while feeling anonymous as well. Um, and Todd Heido also delving more into his works, um, took these landscapes um, on large format and they were these surreal kind of landscapes that he would find and chase. And also these um, interiors that we, uh, he would photograph. Um, he was very famous for his photographs of homes at night, um, which were these very surreal images that he would make on long exposures. Um, and these interiors always have the sense of melancholy and a lot of beauty, um, which stemmed from his childhood, as he would talk about in his work. Um, and another person I really love and talk a lot about is Vivian Sassen. Um, I will be speaking about a few Dutch photographers, actually. Um, and Vivian Sassen being one of them, she grew up in part in um, Africa due to her father's medical missionary trips. And um, so she flows between fine art and fashion and creates these kind of surreal images um, using the body, using people that she um, comes across and uh, just giving new perspective to the image. And another photographer I was really inspired by at the time uh, was Helen Van Meen. She took these images of, um, I, I found her work through books. I have never seen these actually in person, but she took these very surreal images of adolescents um, in their homes or in other spaces. And she actually fully stages every single image um, down to what they're wearing, um, even if they have nail polish on their fingers, like what that looks like. And she would um, fully stage these images. But to me, they always felt so like, almost like a snapshot in time. Um, I believed that these were staged, but I also believed that they were fully real. And I really loved um, her work. And I realized that both Helen Van Meen and Vivian Sassen are working through this history of surrealism. And I didn't quite know that I was so attracted to that, um, especially the image previous to this, um, that I was inherently interested in. And another photographer I'll speak about briefly is Raina Kadikstra. Um, I saw these images at the SF MoMA. They were um, almost human-sized prints, um, along with audio about each um, subject that she photographed. But she is a Dutch photographer, but she traveled around and took these photos of adolescents at the beach. Um, and they were, uh, seeing them in life size, you can just see these postures and poses that um, felt so slightly awkward, maybe unformed. Um, again, something slightly awkward about them, but um, she rendered them so beautifully. and a picture of these prints, um, just huge and were very inspirational and in seeing that you could render, like represent people in this way through photography. Um, but in terms of uh, American photographers, I was also, I found myself being drawn to the work of black photographers in particular um, uh, through the education that I had kind of cobbled up together after studying business. Um, I, you know, you find out about Ansel Adams or Richard Avedon, um, Irving Penn, all these kind of canons of American photography. But to me, I think I really, um, something clicked when I found the work of Carrie Mae Weems, Lorna Simpson, 
um, Dina Lawson. And the series called the Kitchen Table Series, I think is very, uh, it's been talked about quite, quite a bit often. Uh, or it's been talked about quite a bit recently um, in light of the conversations we're having around race and um, black photographers in particular. And when I saw this series, it just felt like something out of even my own home. Um, I could imagine these scenes that she was staging around this kitchen table. It was such a simple idea, um, but it portrayed something very deep about um, a particular Black experience, a, a lived experience that I hadn't seen in other work before. Um, and Dina Lawson was another one of those photographers whose work I found and just fell in love with. Um, I talk about her work all the time, even now, and think about her work quite a bit. And uh, I think I had seen it first at the new photography show at MoMA. Um, that was in 2011, but she um, stages these images. She actually uh, often finds her subjects around bed or off the train and will ask them to pose for her. And everything in these images are also quite staged. Um, she puts up, you know, this curtain with all that tape and will um, create these scenes. But also, um, she also calls her subjects family and all these people, even if they're strangers, she has a connection to, she's drawn to them and brings them into her world of um, photographs and these very particular um, scenes. So while it's very performative in a way, to me, again, it feels very real. And um, even the little Easter eggs you find like um, in, in an image like this one, uh, whether it's the framed photographs of people who look like family or relatives, um, down to the little cup of Chips Ahoy on the, on the corner, um, everything kind of adds up to create this image. So I found that um, like discovering the work of these black photographers, I learned that I wanted to also represent myself or um, me as being Asian American or Korean American, um, just hadn't seen a lot of work that represented someone who looked like me. So for me, that was um, inspiring to see how these photographers would challenge perceptions, um, create new perceptions of who people were in their own communities. Um, so this is a text from a friend that I've always kept. Um, it was also in 2016 that this, or 2017 perhaps, but um, we were talking about how we want to uh, feel who we are as we get older and um, thinking about traveling back to our roots. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, I think many of my peers and I had come into a time of recognizing and revisiting and realizing our Asian and Americanness. Um, so traveling back to our roots was not simply an exercise that we did for fun, but it really felt urgent and needed um, and kind of like a necessity to growth. So um, for me, I really wanted to start thinking about who I was and speaking of the instabilities of life. Um, I found this, I took the date off, but it was November 9th, I believe, um, 2016, and that was election day. And um, we all know what happened on that day, but I didn't realize until looking back um, more recently that that election was uh, such a shift for me um, internally, where I had um, suddenly kind of been brought back to reality. And uh, even in the bio today, um, I often talk about making work that is fantastical or caught between dreams and reality. And for me, uh, about four years ago, almost to the day, I guess, um, is when I felt like my internal shift happened and I had to look at reality. And um, as I was thinking about going to grad school, it was about how do I shift my lens onto what's urgent and what feels needed to uh, like these stories that need to be told. Um, not that the work that I've, I had done or am still doing that is a bit more fantastical is not good, but 
for me, it felt urgent to um, mesh real stories and, um, and really delve deep into my own community. Um, so I'm going to share a clip from I Am Not Your Negro, which is uh, 2017. Uh, I saw it a few days or a few months after the election. And um, the documentarian Raul Peck talks or meshes uh, images with um, images of Gordon Parks, particularly in this clip, with um, a speech by James Baldwin. And I'll let this play. Leaving aside all the physical facts which one can point, leaving aside rape or murder, leaving aside the bloody catalog of oppression, which we are in one way too familiar with already, what this does to the subjugated is to destroy his sense of reality. This means, in the case of an American Negro, born in that glittering republic, and in the moment you are born, since you don't know any better, Every stick and stone and every face is white. And since you have not yet seen the mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace, and to which you owe, your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. So, um, so thinking about this clip, I think uh, I too, I grew up knowing that I felt different or was different. Um, I knew that my parents are immigrants from Korea and um, my lived experience in America, I was in Colorado, Tennessee, California. Um, growing up, I knew things were different for us, but it never felt, and I had never felt othered to a certain extent until this one particular time um, in high school. And uh, this is a clipping from the Wall Street Journal in 2005. So. I was in high school at the time and the headline reads, the new white flight in Silicon Valley to high schools with outstanding academic reputations are losing white students as Asian students move in. Why? Um, and the article details the specifics of my high school. Um, it was high achieving yet somewhat unbalanced in its racial makeup um, for a town that was dominantly still white at the time. And um, for me, the kicker really came in the last line. Um, the two schools put another way that parents rarely articulate so bluntly are too Asian. And although I knew I was different, there was no doubt since I was younger that that was the case. Um, I thought I had been successfully kind of assimilating into American culture um, until this point kind of shook me out of this mundane lived experience and told me that I was fully the other, um, kind of what James Baldwin was talking about in terms of that moment you realize that you are not part of maybe what Americans or America is. And I began to question that. And um, this moment in high school was something I reflected on when I got into grad school, um, thinking about what were some of the pain points for me growing up and what something uh, that sh kind of shook me out of my normal everyday experience and this was definitely one of them. Um, so keeping this moment in mind during my time in the program, I really began to think about making work about uh, whatever experiences that were relevant to me and I thought of how I as an Asian woman and often confused with any other Asian woman in whatever spaces we exist. Um, for example, in academic settings, sometimes I just uh, have come to expect that I'll be called by another Asian female's name, uh, even to the last day of the semester. And 
Um, for me, I think I was really thinking about this desire to be unique, but also um, have community and have unity with other Asian women around me. Um, so for this shoot, I really just um, asked for Asian women who are interested in participating in a shoot um, online or through friends and had gathered five women together and um, kind of employed different strategies of staging the images. Um, I had asked them all to dress in these, um, in these dresses that I provided and then um, controlled a lot of the frame. But um, in the end, I really wanted to embody this idea of unified yet unique women. And uh, the last image, um, I really thought of a phrase that comes from, I believe a Chinese proverb that says, uh, women hold up half the sky. And it was me really working out these kind of primitive thoughts around, um, I want to be united, but I want to be unique. And um, what does that look like? And bringing people together. And even through the experience of shooting with these women um, was so empowering for a lot of us and um, just a really fun time as well. So um, that was one of those first projects that had come out of those thoughts that I've been having. Um, and the next body of work that I will talk about, um, I've titled tentatively, Have You Eaten? And again, I'm thinking about Dina Lawson here. Um, this one is called Blinky and Tony Forever. Uh, Blood Orange has used this as an album cover before. Um, and this image again, has so much to look at in terms of their relationship, this intimacy we feel um, down to the curtains and the sheets of the bed. And um, it has always been on my mind in terms of um, this image of a couple. And I, I believe if I'm not correct, it, it, or if, if I'm not mistaken, um, these two subjects actually didn't know each other and she had asked them to pose together. So. Um, she, again, was creating this kind of intimacy within this image. Um, I'm also thinking at this time, I had gone to MoMA PS1 and seen um, an exhibition by Elle Perez. And Elle, uh, they've exhibited at the Whitney Biennial recently. Um, they're from the Bronx and uh, part of the Puerto Rican diaspora in that community. and. Uh, this particular exhibition had this incredible kind of um, collage of images and words that um, they had taken themselves, but also taken from readings that they had done. And this one particular um, bit under the knee, there's, there's a cutout, uh, there's a scan of a book that they had been reading. And um, the first line of this book called Ghost Image is, um, photography is also an act of love. And it kind of stuck with me. And I had always seen a thought of photography as other things, you know, like um, documentation or as evidence of something. But um, that line, photography is also an act of love, had always stuck with me. Um, so I, uh, the series for me really began actually with a, um, this image, which is actually an assignment that I completed. Um, it's the only assignment that we had ever gotten in grad school. And it was to recreate an image of yours with constraints on it given by uh, another classmate. So the uh, image that a classmate chose was this one. But she had told me, you can't use young models. Um, the image has to be very saturated with color and it can't be outdoors. Um, so that weekend I happened to be uh, in the city with my parents. Um, so I asked them to become my models and um, I painted these backdrops. I put it up in a studio and they were my willing uh, subjects for the, for the uh, shoot. So um, yeah, I, to be honest, I did it in order to just get the assignment over with. But um, what I found actually was that this photograph of my parents 
in this infinite embrace. Um, and also we shot for maybe an hour, hour and a half in the studio. Um, it was actually the longest time that I had ever seen them physically touching uh, in my entire life. Um, I rarely see them kiss each other or, you know, have these like uh, acts of love towards each other in terms of touch. But um, for me, I realized this like image of them in this infinite embrace was the longest that I've ever seen them embrace and um, maybe ever will. Um, but I thought a lot about how physical touch is this um, Western way of displaying love. And for my parents, the act of posing for this image was their way of showing me love. Um, and I began to wonder what this looks, for my, looks like for my generation or people around me and people that I know. Um, so again, I found myself just kind of recreating this image over and over in new ways. Um, and I still wanted to represent different expressions of romance. Um, whether it's a couple um, or friends I knew who are dating each other, um, now engaged, I believe. Um, and also even trying to convey this without seeing their faces, um, turning it um, onto textures and maybe conveying something more than a traditional portrait could. So I'm constantly interested in how other markers of identity reveal age or relationship and generations. Um, and then I photographed three women of Wing On Wo and Co, which is the longest standing, oldest standing um, Chinatown storefront in New York City. And I thought of this divide between the East and the West um, and also the ways that they converge. Um, I thought a lot about how I went home again, um, maybe a few months later, and my parents would continue to sit for my photographs, um, knowing that that's what they knew how to do in order to support their photographer daughter um, and show me an act of love, I suppose. And I also began to pick up on various objects um, around the house that kind of displayed or conveyed love. Um, that I hadn't really noticed before or kind of knew, but didn't pay much attention to. Um, and I think I was at home for about a week, but just shot all these images around the home and around um, Cupertino where I uh, was. So um, this kind of collage of images, <clears throat> for me, um, I picked up on these objects and rather than uh, my parents showing this love to me by saying I love you, they would, you know, cut fruit for me or pray for me. That's why there's some images of um, religious iconography around the house that is so prevalent for me. Um, I also found old photographs of um, their grandparents and um, collected it within this image. Um, and even the middle image of a garden, I think, um, creating a garden and being able to have that space and provide is another way of showing care and love um, for my parents. So yeah, my parents and their parents and their parents had never really said, I love you, um, but rather they would ask, have you eaten? And um, as I was thinking about like intimacy, love, what that means, what that looks like, um, that's what I ended up titling this series of work. And the last kind of group of images and videos that I'll show, um, I titled Tribe at the time, um, maybe also how do you photograph air, um, but we'll get into it. So I found myself um, in grad school also constantly looking for um, photographers of color, particularly Asian American, um, artists to reference or look look to. And there are very few and far in between, but um, Patty Chang was one of them. And she still is making work right now. I'd seen an exhibit at the Queens Museum, but this particular uh, video of hers is from 1999. So it's an early video work of hers. And I'll show it here.
so it, go, it goes on for a few more minutes, I believe it's seven minutes total, um, but this performance of her drinking from her own reflection in the fountain, um, I found that to be very um, intriguing. Also, this performance that she's doing, um, for me, it also, uh, I use a lot of mirrors in my work. It really kind of made me think a lot about like, identity or who I am and um, what she was saying around um, her own reflection. And uh, there are a lot of these early video works of hers, um, one also including her parents um, that are very intriguing and I would recommend you check them out as well. Um, and another uh, piece that I had found around this time that I was thinking about my work is by Arthur Jaffa. Um, a bit of a trigger warning, there are some images of violence in this video. Um, it's just a clip from a much longer piece. Uh, the whole thing you actually can't find on the internet, but um, I found this on YouTube. I've tried to watch it in various forms. Uh, I think I've cobbled together most of it through just finding um, pieces from the internet. But um, yeah, I will play it. And then When you're on a ocean like me, this is a God dream. This is a God dream. This is everything. This is everything. Yeah, I think I first came across this when I was thinking about video and um, Arthur Jaffa also has a practice of just collecting images and collecting video clips now um, thanks to the internet and you know, cell phone imagery and such like that. But um, he, he had this practice of uh, collecting images into a binder and just adding to it all the time. And it was whatever image that he felt attracted to or couldn't stop looking at, even if it was hard to look at or repulsive. And he would um, carry around these books and now they've become these like Adobe Bridge folders. And um, Love is a Message, The Message is Death is also um, him kind of putting together these clips um, from the news, from pop culture, from history that he's seen and putting it together to, um, I think, create uh, questions around um, how people people perceive the Black experience, um, kind of expressing things about like, the extremes of joy and um, sorrow or death and revival that can happen uh, within the community. So I found this to be so strong and affecting and it's always been with me since. And um, the other a uh, painter actually that I'll talk about is Lynette Yadom Boache, and she um, is a contemporary painter. She uh, won the Turner Prize in 2015. She um, created these images, uh, these paintings that I had seen at the New Museum in New York around this time. Um, and there are these paintings of people in kind of undefined space and for me, I think what I really felt and was attracted to were 
this feeling of melancholy and this feeling of placelessness, but also presence. Um, I think all these paintings and the people in her paintings, some of them are floor to ceiling paintings, so um, huge, but when you walk into the room, you feel this presence, you feel this calm, but also a slight sadness. And um, I think that kind of melancholy is something I knew it, it's been a word we'll talk about it in a bit too but um that feeling is something i wanted to convey throughout my photographs as well um, so as i was researching and just trying to um, find i guess the words or even the academic um, thought behind what i felt um, i came across this book called the melancholy of race um, and uh, Anne, Anne Chang, she's a scholar, um, she's still writing about um, race and Asian American experience, but she describes this uh, term called racial melancholia, and she describes it as a state of being physically stuck due to the inability of reaching a lost, idealized racial perfection defined by dominant white culture. Um, and this term to me kind of reminded me of that experience in high school. Um, it's reminded me of many experiences really, um, where it, there's this in-betweenness of feeling like you're being othered, but also accepted. And then um, when it's convenient, you're part of American culture. Um, when it's inconvenient, uh, you're looked down upon. And I think this term racial melancholia kind of gave me the words for a feeling that had been, um, that I knew was existing underneath uh, my experience as well. Um, so she goes on to kind of assert that the question of racialization of Asian Americans is um, the sense that the history of virulent racism directed against Asians and Asian Americans has been at once consistently upheld and denied. Um, so, Kind of struggling between black and white asian americans occupy a truly ghostly position in the story of american racialization um, and for me i think i really grabbed on this word ghostly and um, i had read this last year but it also um, relates really closely to a book that's out right now um, or has came out this year um, called Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. And um, I won't read all of this, but I will um, read part of it. Oops. Um, she says, uh, when I hear the phrase Asians are next in line to be white, I replace the word white with disappear. Asians are next in line to disappear. Um, we will disappear into this country's amnesiac fog. Um, and later she talks about, uh, writes, it's like being ghosted, I suppose, where deprived of all social cues, I have no relational gauge for my own behavior. Um, uh, and in the end, she mentions until I vanish. And, um, I think just discovering writers who were giving word to feelings that I had felt. Um, this actually I read after the fact, but uh, after I had made um, photographs and a video, but um, all of it kind of wraps up so well what I had been feeling and what I was trying to convey um, with the images. Um, so right before we get into the images, um, I'll introduce one last reading that I was doing at the time. Um, I was part of a race and representation class um, my last semester, or almost last semester in grad school. And this book was kind of a big opening point for me um, in really thinking about um, this word futurity. So Tina Camp is a Black feminist scholar, and um, she talks about Black futurity. And you know what the future is. Futurity is like the state of the future. And she talks about um, what does that, what does it mean for a Black feminist to think about, consider, or conceive the concept of futurity. Um, and this one particular part, she talks about 
how we need to think about the future as not just what will happen, but that which will have had to happen. Um, and she talks about this grammar that, you, that we use, that the tense has to change, um, that the future um, isn't just what hasn't happened yet, but what must happen. Um, and this way of, you know, I think we can get caught up a lot in thinking about things that are wrong or, um, you know, staying in a place of what melancholia is or um, feeling that. But for me, this opened up this idea of we as image makers or artists, whatever you're doing, have the possibility to create the future, to imagine the future and um, create that through our work and through what we convey. And um, yeah, I think that the power really rests in, in artists. Um, so I will get into some of the images. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about each person in the image and what we were talking about um, through this. So I had created kind of the series around um, people around me um, who are uh, around my age and maybe thinking about similar things and also being cultural producers, um, whether it's like being an artist in some way or uh, pursuing something creative. Um, so the first time I met Ryan in person, he told me he wants to become, quote, the best fucking vocalist and songwriter to ever exist because that's how you have true influence on culture. Um, his music alludes to all the raw emotions of youth containing internal conflict and dualities such as violence and beauty, femininity and masculinity, and joy and sorrow. Um, Tazlor, D-A-S-L-L, -L, is how you spell and say her name, Das for short. Um, she's a dancer and we bonded over the fact that our Korean mothers have finally come on board with our freelance and creative pursuits. Um, at the time, she was excited to do her hair again soon, um, a fresh look to make her feel more herself. Um, I'll go on to, I met Dee Dee on a photo shoot once. She works as a model while pursuing her jewelry line on the side. Dee Dee is a plus size model tackling criticism and prejudice, not just from the fashion industry, but even from her own family members. Having blue hair and tattoos over her body makes her stand out even more. But she believes in boldly taking up space, being a loud and outspoken Asian woman. Um, and lastly, Sammy is the first person I met on the first day of college. Um, he has now become a floral designer in San Francisco, and he often tells me of the joys and challenges of being the one Asian male among a sea of white women in the industry. Um, so each portrait I've taken stems from my relationships with each person and their kind of a singular result of a multitude of conversations, um, experiences, uh, whether they're close friends or acquaintances. And um, I really thought of these people as the beginnings of a tribe, um, which is why I called it that, of creative performers and artists, um, people pursuing creative uh, fields, hoping to succeed in our respective mediums. And through these images, I really wanted to imagine a future, um, imagine us and materialize us and not let us be left as these ghosts um, that Anne Chang speaks of between black, brown and white America, um, but really stake our, our place in today's visual culture. Um, so while thinking of my immediate community, I also thought a lot about like a, this rapidly changing conversation around um, representation in media and pop culture. Um, so really thinking about that Arthur J. Focus, I just kind of thought of all these um, clips that I had seen or uh, could think of when it came to my own history in this country and also uh, contemporary examples of um, representation and breaking stereotypes and bringing in new types of representation. So um, I 
created this video that I'll be showing. This is kind of the first draft. Um, there were actually more iterations afterwards, but this is kind of that um, boiled down piece of all the clips that I was thinking about and wanted to show this um, here. So. So, um, yeah, in this video, I, it really came from this thought, the idea, the core idea that for me was this thought of oscillation of emotion and um, these ups and downs of what it feels like to be Asian American, uh, particularly, I should say, East Asian American. Um, I can't speak for everyone and particularly want to speak more towards Korean American going forward. Um, but this video was kind of just remixing this uh, dance that I had seen Desol do um, on our Instagram actually, where she got up and then fell. Um, and that was the only action, but to me it was so powerful. And I really took that um, and asked her to re-perform it in a studio space. Um, in other iterations of this video, there's some more intercut um, dance into the clips, but um, yeah, I think this is a good show of what, where my mind was at the time, um, kind of thinking of all these um, instances uh, from history or from contemporary times that I put together and um, created this out of. So uh, yeah, it just felt like at the time, um, I also titled this, How Do You Photograph Air? 
Um, it's something a professor had to, uh, said in a critique. Um, come on, say she's an incredible photographer, um, but she was expressing something that I had been feeling again, and that's how do you photograph an experience that you can't show, um, a feeling that you can't show, like how do you photograph air? And um, that's a question that I had been thinking a lot about. And if this were to have an alternative title, um, this body of work would be that. Um, so yeah, I really feel like we're coming up towards an hour, but um, it's our time to dig in and get specific and be honest in the work that we make as artists. Um, as visual artists, I really think there's so much power in images. Um, we're inundated with them and to be able to represent them, um, represent and represent are all part of the same word. And um, for me, I think there's a lot of power in doing so and uh, telling our specific stories um, in, in the ways that we best can, whether it's through visual art or another medium. Um, and I wanted to end on uh, it will be the last clip, but um, this is Arthur Jaffa and he's actually, he gave a talk um, about his work and I think he has just some really great words to say to close this out. So, I'm mostly driven to put forth images of black people. It's the thing that I grew up with a profound system that was an absence of. It's what drives what I do. Um, about a year into After Love is a Message, and I started to go through what I would say was my second cycle of doing talks and interviews and stuff. Um, Love is a Message had just opened in London after the Serpentine show closed. And I, they, and I did my first press john, I guess, where they just lined a bunch of uh, journalists up and I did like eight people in a row, which was interesting to me. Um, and I would say maybe only one person didn't immediately say, oh, I hear that you only make work for black people and you don't care what white people see. Because I had said in the interview, I'm not addressing white people. Now, my thing is this. I can explain a lot of different ways, but I think the best way to explain it is to say this. Is 99.9% um, of what we see is coming from the perspective of white people. That's just the truth of um, As a consequence of that, black people, people of color, women, have developed what I call, they developed that muscle, it's an empathy muscle, it's the capacity to be able to sit in front of something that's not coming from your subject position and to process it, have an opinion about it, feel something, be in that person's skin, see the world from their perspective, right? Um, that's important. I think it's important. It's the very basis of empathy. To be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So, in effect, I would say the most caring thing I can do for white people is to not address them. Do not speak to them. I'm very, 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 very happy when anybody likes my work or is interested in my work. I'm very excited to have conversations with people about it and stuff. But it's a little like, I, I was thinking like Eric Clapton's Layla, the greatest sort of, you know, he fell in love with his best friend's wife. He loved it so much that his best friend said, go for it, man, you know? And that's how much he loved him. And he wrote Layla, you know, Layla, you got me on my knees, Layla, you know? He not singing to everybody. He's singing to Patty, he's singing to Patty. That's why it's powerful. He not saying, Layla, you got me on knees, and Franklin, you down there somewhere too. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, no, nah, he's talking to Layla. He's addressing Layla. Everybody else gets to listen in. So that's how I see it. It's like, I, my secret weapon is I am addressing black people. 
everybody else gets to listen in. I'm very happy that people want to listen in. I think maybe there's something to be gained from listening in, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying to June, I want to thank you so much for a stellar lecture. Um, the way you so carefully laid out the tapestry of your influences and, and the generosity of even, you know, finishing with somebody else's words, which were incredible, powerful, moving. And um, I am actually zooming in from Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one piece of the puzzle that I'm wondering um, where, where it fits in. Mm -hmm. um, because you've talked, um, extensively about your influences um, among African-American artists and Asian artists, Asian-American artists. And I'm, I'm wondering where um, Korea itself fits into this exploration. Um, I would be, I'm quite eager to spend more time in Korea if possible, um, just to explore. I think there's, there's this feeling um, that a lot of us have, I think, where we go to Korea and we still feel too American. Um, but in America, it's like, I think I'm more American. Uh, there's, there's no real way to divide, you know, what percentage of what I am. Um, but I think Korea is somewhere where I go and I find a lot of comfort. Um, uh, most of my family lives there, except for my immediate family. Um, even my father's there. So um, a lot of the experiences that I have in Korea, I think are very new, but feel familiar. Um, and I would love to spend more time there kind of extended. Um, I've only ever been there for maybe a couple weeks at a time, maybe the longest is a few weeks. So um, yeah, there, there was a time when I did go to Korea and try to take some photographs. Um, so I do have some work from there that I haven't quite fit into some other work that I've made. Um, but Korea is really where a lot of it begins too, um, even from my parents and my mom is actually moving to Korea shortly soon too. So I think all of that uh, really makes me think about like what possibilities there are to explore there as well and bring that back and kind of mesh all these things together. Um, uh, just an extent, quick extension of that question. Do you mm -hmm. keep an eye out on uh, Korean uh, photography or Korean art um, as, a, as an inspiration for your practice? Um, are you asking, do I? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think um, there, there are a lot of people, a lot of young people um, that I found you know, just through Instagram and whatnot. But um, there are also so many uh, Korean artists that can be referenced. Um, I didn't mention like Nam Joon Pak. He's Korean American. Um, he lived mm -hmm. in New York for much of his life. But um, I think he's someone who at the time, I was talking about this with a friend about how he knew what was going on at the time in terms of being in America, but he made these videos where he would uh, kind of like what Arthur Jaffa had done, but he mashed up images from Western um, concerts and also with Korean traditional performance and such like that. And mm -hmm. um, he's someone I've thought a lot about, looked at his work a lot. And there are some other um, Korean photographers, I think, it's interesting trying to keep up with more contemporary Korean photographers. Um, that's been some place, or I've done that mostly through Instagram or mm -hmm. uh, the internet, but I find that there's such a specific type of aesthetic that comes out as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that interesting. It, it's quite different too from, uh, from Korean Americans perhaps, but, uh, looking at that work too has also been inspiring. All right. Uh, well, I have a uh, question here from or a comment perhaps, because I don't see a question mark at the end, uh, from Fongvo the Great. 
Uh, and if I mispronounce anybody's names, please forgive me, uh, but I, I'm doing my best um, guessing. I think in most Asian cultures, we share the same language of love by not saying the word love. It is heartwarming when you mention that your parents show love by asking if you have eaten yet, the same as my parents and every other Asian parents across the globe. Thank you for sharing your inspiration and bringing awareness about the Asian American and Asian in America community in this country. All right. Um, and I, I think I've heard that in Chinatown too. <laughs> I mean, my wanderings through Chinatown, the, the greeting as have you eaten yet? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's very universal. Um, and even beyond Asian cultures, which I find uh, very interesting. I thought maybe that was very specific to um, my culture or my family even, but um, mm -hmm. I think we found that it extends kind of universally as well. Well, it's certainly true about my mother-in-law here in Seoul. I mean, every mm -hmm. time I walk in, the first thing she asks is, have you eaten? <laughs> <laughs> um, here is a question from uh, Tomas, our department chair. And he says, uh, wondering about the forms your work takes, are you producing prints or a book? Can you talk about that part of your practice? Sure. Um, if you've seen my Instagram, I've posted about like a zine or a promo book that I've made. Um, I didn't talk at all today about like the freelance work that I do or um, getting commissioned work, but a lot of the work that I've shown and some other client work that I've done, I've put into a promo book. Um, and it kind of is a practice for maybe a bigger book that I would love to do in the future with um, more of this work I think personally, I feel like the work can be worked on for many more years before it becomes materialized into a book. But um, that, that book for me was quite big, just in terms of uh, getting all those pieces together and presenting them. Um, I ended up just selling a bunch of them because uh, due to COVID, no one's at an office right now. So um, I did send a, a bunch out to some offices, but um, Luckily, they're also in a lot of different homes now, um, which is great. But I think for me, in terms of like photo books in particular, that's somewhere I would love to um, delve more into deeply. Um, I really feel like a photo book should be made when the work is complete. And for me, it's always felt like all my projects are still in progress. So um, that, that would be the goal, really. Um, and maybe within the next three to five years, if I can um, get that, get like bodies of work really completed. And I think that's the, the focus, especially now um, with a lot of work being on hold, it feels like a perfect time to focus on the work um, in terms of personal work and continuing a lot of these threads of thoughts that I've had um, that I shared today and creating those into, um, yeah, more, more physical, uh, physical pieces rather than exhibitions or whatnot. We have a question here from um, Justin John Lee. Hi, June, being a first generation Korean American, has that affected your relationship with the photography industry? Have you ever felt pigeonholed in the assignments and opportunities you're given? Mm. Um, I think this is, uh, I know that Justin is also speaking from experience, um, but I've also felt this in a way too, um, I think with even commissions or just being commissioned for a portrait, um, a lot of people will be like, well, we'll ask you if there's like an Asian uh, person that we need to photograph. And it's like, well, I can photograph a lot of people. And I think this is a conversation that's been coming up a lot more now in the past two, three weeks too, with um, Black photographers being commissioned for the right types of stories, but also being given the creative freedom to go beyond just their own community. Um, and I think there's something tricky, and I've talked, to about, uh, talked about it with a lot of friends where um, we, in general, can get pigeonholed into, like, if you're an artist of color, you can only make work about your identity, and you can't make work about other things or other um, communities. But 
I think that's something we need to start resisting in a way. Um, I, I think for me, I'm still in this zone of like, I'm totally fine just focusing on uh, Korean American culture or whatever, what, whatever that looks like. But um, as the industry as a whole, I think that really is an issue um, that has come up. And I'm really hoping that with um, just more consciousness as it's coming right now, uh, I, I believe it's really important for us as Asian photographers to also be um, advocating for Black photographers and for any POC um, a photographer of color, a minority photographer to be able to have um, assignments given or um, work that is relevant not only to them, but other communities as well. So. Um, I'm hoping that this time is really opening up these avenues and uh, making people more conscious of their own biases or inherent thoughts around um, commissioning people for work. I believe you've answered this already, but I, I will read it nonetheless mm. from Brian Cho. Uh, considering that the creative community tends to be exclusive rather than inclusive, how have you had to reconcile with this exclusivity as a minority and a female creative? P.S. I love that it's universal Korean parental trait to cut fruit for their children. <laughs> um, yeah, I do think maybe I answered that a bit. How do I reconcile with the exclusivity? Hmm. I think I'm just trying to make sure I do my thing, <laughs> whatever that is. And um, I, I don't know if I've felt very pigeonholed necessarily. There have been instances that have come up um, where maybe someone's mentioned like, oh, wait until there's someone right for you. But um, I do think we as the image makers and as the artists have the ability to go beyond that or to make the work that breaks those stereotypes or um, buckets, I guess. So I would just encourage anyone else. And I think for me too, it's a reminder to just be honest as, uh, as, uh, as honest as I can be and also um, pursue the work that I really am interested in. And that will lead to the right kinds of um, industry work as well. Um. Here's a question from Sherry Shen. Uh, thank you, June. I have, melt, I have felt many of the sentiments you have shared with us today. Thank you for being so open and sharing fragility and vulnerability in your journey. What is your advice to a young female photographer trying to navigate an industry where we are racial as well as gender minority and particularly in an industry that boasts strength and loudness? And if I can ask a also, do you have advice in approaching meaningful personal projects in tandem with growing and learning from others as a young photographer? I guess I'm talking about the confidence to share your work while a young photographer. So it's a two-part question. Um, mm -hmm. Feel free to. Yeah. Um, strength and loud. Yeah. There's a lot of, <laughs> like, the louder you are or the more outspoken you are, I think that gets rewarded in a way or is paid attention to. Um, it's interesting, I think I thought about this even in the context of like grad school, um, in class, whoever, you know, makes a bigger or louder comment will get more of the attention or that's where the conversation goes. And I think that's something I've had to learn to, um, one, like I can't change myself. So I, I know that I can't, just shift myself into becoming someone who's going to be boisterous and loud all the time. And um, maybe even in my work, um, that one assignment I talked about where uh, someone encouraged me to be, to, to use more saturated color, like that shook me out of my boundaries, but I think I still did it in a way that felt like me. Um, and I think that's really important to still stay true to who you are. Um, whether that is being very loud and boisterous or to have strength while being soft or um, having a voice while being um, a bit understated. 
So I think um, the, the answer that I, or the point I always go back to is that you just have to make the work. And um, I think the right people will come to you as well um, once, uh, when you're making the work that speaks strong, strongest to you. Um, I found that like even, this is kind of a tangent, but even with like Instagram, I think people are scared to break out of a specific style because of what if people unfollow me or whatnot. But I'm in this mindset of the right people will come. Um, and I think the audience that you want will really uh, latch on to the work that you make, um, the more that it feels honest and true. Um, so I don't know if I even answered the question <laughs> um, fully, but I think the answer for me is always to like, do the work well, do it um, honestly and present it in a way um, that, that feels right to you. Um, and I think that's like, a great answer. I mean, personally, I think um, with the way you, you responded to that is, is so true. You know, we, uh, we have to stay open because the alternative is to close off and that's not a very good alternative and, and then continue to be true. Uh, right. to what matters to us, what's in our heart. Um, and it's a little harder when you're young, I'll say that. It's a little harder when you're young and she's asking from the perspective of a young photographer. Uh, so yeah. hang in there, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, trust yourself. Uh, yeah. Here's a question from Chloe Glass. Um, Hi, thank you so much for presenting your work and your inspirations. You mentioned that the power to create the future rests with artists. How do you see the role of museums in this? Hmm, it's a great question. Um, I think with museums, I, I see it as another place where as much as artists, we're being uh, true to ourselves and also welcoming diversity and encouraging diversity. I think museums are also another pillar that needs to be able to do the same. Um, and I frankly don't have like a ton of experience in, with museums necessarily personally, but um, knowing that those people at, who are curating or um, creating exhibitions, uh, pinpointing what gets seen and what gets exhibited, those people are the gatekeepers of that pillar uh, in the art world. Um, I really feel like, I mean, it's so many conversations we've been having recently about any workplace really, um, but that the change comes from within and that um, I think my mind is really on like having more uh, diverse curators and um, heads of museums. I mean, even funding is kind of a crazy uh, part to get into, I suppose, but I think uh, artists to um, even with the Whitney Biennial recently, um, there was a lot of discussion and kind of um, controversy around one of the board members um, who was, I believe, funding tear gas or, or part, like involved with it. And a lot of the artists had stood up to um, that at, like as a principle and um, even left the Biennial and took their work out of um, the Whitney Biennial. And I think, um, as much as museums are the gatekeepers, they're also at the mercy of artists and, and the work that they are able to show and what artists demand and being able to see that kind of change and that board member left, I believe. So um, yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's a symbiotic <clears throat> relationship and um, artists as much as museums have these um, responsibilities. That's a great point. I mean, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship and we have to know our power uh, and remember that. Right. Um, we have time for one last question. So um, here it is from Maddie. Thank you, June. It's so nice to hear from an Asian American female photographer. How did you make the choice to pivot to photography? When did you know that it was something you wished to explore as more than a personal form of expression escape? Um, I think, uh, even like going back to college days, I knew even as a business major that I really wanted to be in art school. Um, but at the time I kind of stuck it out. Um, but I would say 
what really kept me going and onto this path and even to consider myself fully an artist is I think I just knew that that's what made my heart like beat faster or made me feel like I had found um, kinship when I find the work of an artist that I love um, or an artist who is putting out work that really speaks to me. And I was sharing so much of my inspirations today because I think I always go back to those people. Um, I also miss going to museums because that's what I do when I get stuck. Um, and hopefully one day we'll all go back to museums, but um, even looking at you know, books and photo books. That's why that's also really important to me to be able to make as an artist. Um, but yeah, I think that those, those moments where I was like, uh, just reassured to keep being a photographer was when I found that work and also was encouraged to make my own and add to that conversation and really um, realizing that we as artists have this power to um, shape culture and shape what people um, see and because we're in a visual medium and a photographic medium that requires like people in front of a camera or um, you know subjects in front of something like in front of a camera whatever that is now it could be zoom um, or facetime but uh, yeah I think that's like those points where I found that kind of work um, really inspired me and um, to the point where, uh, when did I want it to be less of maybe a fantastical pursuit and more of a reality-based one? I, I regret, or I don't wanna say that necessarily because I don't wanna make divisions between the two. I think both are part of my work um, no matter what, but uh, it really was like the election and then thinking about my own personal identity and how to convey that. and seeing so much of this work that I've shared today that conveys um, a personal experience really well. Well, yeah. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank you, June and MPS uh, DP for hosting these lectures uh, this past year. And uh, we will see you all in the fall. Take good care, everybody. Thanks again, June. Thanks for having me. Thanks, June. Thanks, Simon.